Okay. Hi, everybody. You know, I think that, you know, we will have uh, more people coming. Uh, but we have to start right away because we have, you know, we have to finish this at 4 p.m. sharp. My name is Evgeny Alberts. Um, my title here is Distinguished uh, Journalist in Residence. It is rather ridiculous uh, to say that about yourself, right? <laughs> uh, that <laughs> I'm editor of the Moscow-based website, New Times, now blocked by the uh, Russian government, and an anchor of the Absolute Alberts on my YouTube uh, channel, Ezeha Moscow, where, you know, this program was broadcasted for 19 years straight. Also, you know, of course, you know, blocked by the Russian government, you know, they took it off the year. Uh, this year I'm running this series of interviews titled In Conversation with Gany Alberts and my guest today, the real power couple. I love this, you know, yes, this, this word, this, uh, this uh, expression. The real power couple, journal Susan Lassen and Peter Baker. Thank you very much for having, for uh, doing this and for coming to the center. And I'm thrilled to ask, uh, so I will, I will be asking uh, questions, but first I would like to say that um, the director of the center, Professor Josh uh, Tucker, you know, director of the journal, uh, NYU Journal Center of uh, Advanced Study of Russia, he's away and therefore, you know, uh, but you know, he wanted to be here, but you know, just he had to be on the east, on the west coast uh, of the United States. I guess, you know, he's given lecture to your son. Special. <laughs> By the way, do you know that Dasha Naval now is so? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. did the same program that uh, our son is doing. Yeah. Uh, it's called Structured Liberal Education. Yeah. Really? Structured Liberal yes. Education. Yeah, okay. Know. Okay. Okay. So uh, my first question, of course, will be with regard to this book. You see, it. it's just a recent book, just the last book, not the last book. I don't know whether you know you have any prejudice against the word last because in Russian they no longer say last but lately. Mm -hmm. They sort of you know yes they're biased. Mm -hmm. It's very strong. Crime, they say crime. You know it's sort of, you know it's, it's, it sounds for the Russian uh, ear awful. But anyway, you see this book. It is the recent book, The Divider, Trump in the White House, and you know this book just hit the stands. However, they already the New York Times marked the book as, quote, the most comprehensive and detailed account of the Trump presidency yet published. And the Washington Post wrote, quote, a simulta a, 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 a sumptuous feast of astonishing tales. The more one reads, the more one wishes to read. In fact, it's true, because, you know, I've been reading, you know, last night, and, you know, it, it just, just, you know, takes you in. You know, it's, it's amazing in that respect. Let me very briefly introduce to our guests. Uh, Susan Glass is a staff writer with The New Yorker. She runs a column titled Letter from Biden's Washington, first in the, in the last New Yorker. That is uh, uh, Susan's column, last New Yorker, right? Every week. Every week, but already uh, every Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so Susan was born into newspaper family. Her parents, uh, I was, it was very interesting to find out that your parents founded Legal Times, a weekly legal newspaper. Um, Susan graduated from Harvard, edited the Sunday Outlook section of the Washington Post, covered wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, served as co chief of the Washington Post Bureau in Moscow, and another co chief was her husband, Peter Baker. In between, got a child, edited foreign affairs and politica, and was one of the founders of the Politica magazine. And also she co-authored three books uh, with uh, Peter Baker. Um, Peter Baker, with whom uh, Susan co-authored those books, Kremlin Rise, it's about on Putin's conquest of Russia, biography of the former secretary of state James Baker, it's called A Man Who Ran Washington, right? And now, uh, and now you know this the divider. So uh, Peter Baker covered five administrations, from Bill Clinton and through uh, Joe Biden, covered Afghanistan and Iraq. So, uh, in fact, you know Saddam Hussein's uh, uh, Iraq. After twenty years with the Washington Post, joined the New York Times and became its chief White House correspondent, authored seven books, briefly was the 
the New York Times uh, bureau chief in, in Jerusalem, right? Very briefly. Very briefly, but return back now. I remember this because, you know, I was in your house slightly before you went there. And then you returned back because all of a sudden Trump was elected as the president. Yes. And just, you know, nobody knew how to cover the Trump White House but you. So, so welcome. And once again, thank you very much for, for doing this. Now, if I may, my first question will be the following. On Thursday, President Biden said, quote, uh, that, you know, Putin, uh, that he knows Putin fairly well. And the Russian president was not joking when he talks about potential use of tactical nuclear weapons or biological or uh, chemical weapons. We have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't think there is any such things as the ability to easily use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon, end of quote. Mm -hmm. It sounds pretty awful to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So my question, how would you comment on this? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Jenny, for including us in this great program. We're delighted to be here. All right. All right. Perfect. Even more delighted now. So <laughs> all right. We're, we're delighted to be here with everybody. Still not on. No? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? That's all right. As long as people who are watching can hear me, that's yes. I'll speak up for anybody in the room. But thank you for having us. We're so delighted to be here. We're delighted that Jenny is here. We were so concerned uh, about her and all of our friends who are trying to practice journalism, which is now unfortunately basically a crime in Russia. And the courage that Genia has demonstrated and, and that her colleagues have demonstrated in the face of this crackdown is an inspiration to us and I think an inspiration to, to everyone everywhere. Um, you're right. It is a chilling thing for an American president to say the word Armageddon, the idea that there could be a nuclear uh, war is, is, is frightening. Um, now, the White House quickly walked it back a little bit today by saying we don't have anything new to indicate that Putin is about to do something. What they have told us in the past, privately in recent days, is they have not seen any intelligence that suggests the deploying of assets or resources that would indicate somebody wanted to actually do it. So they still, I think, believe to some extent this is bluster and, and uh, saber rattling by a leader who recognizes that he is in a weak position, that he has lost a lot of ground in Ukraine and not achieved his, uh, his strategic goals and therefore is trying to scare everybody into uh, remembering that he's a great person and that Russia is a great power. But having said that, you have to take it seriously because it is so serious. I, I talked to a White House official and they, they said, you know, I said, where are you on a one to 10 scale of concern? He said four, thinking I think that that would be not that bad. And to me, the idea of a four for nuclear. Four out of 10? Four out of yeah. 10. Oh is, my goodness. Is, That's scary. That's very, very, very scary. 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 Okay. Very scary. So we ought to be scary. Um, but what, I thought it then became six. No, it had been. The other guy was six. This guy was four. Anyway, we, either way, any number you pick other than zero is too much and too scary. And so, you know, they have to prepare for this. Now, it makes no sense for Putin to use it. It would not accomplish a lot of the things that he says he wants to accomplish. He would be killing Russians, almost certainly, if he were to use it, if it if any of these battlegrounds in eastern Ukraine. A lot of Russian speakers are there. His own soldiers would be potentially in danger. There is an argument that the winds would blow back into Russia. So it would be, it would not be a militarily smart thing to do, the experts say. But he has shown again and again that the things that we consider to be rational do not necessarily drive his decision making. Thank you, Shania. And thank you um, a lot for doing this and for being here because we think the most important thing is for you to keep doing journalism and you can't do yeah, that you. if you're if you're not in a place where you're allowed to speak freely and so we're we're grateful that you're here we're grateful that nyu has made this home for you um if the president of the united states warned about armageddon you have to take him seriously right and so to me i i, I learned a couple things from biden saying this number one uh which is not good news that they are in there gaming out how to respond to a Putin use of nuclear weapons 
that Biden has found himself with no good options. So that's one thing I take away from his comments is that the American kind of scenarios here are very bad and that they lead to American escalation because there's no way uh, not to respond uh, as if this was a nuclear attack on us and our interests in many ways, right? So that's part of what I take away, which is, which is very scary. Number two, um, I do think it reflects uh, Biden's lack of discipline as a politician. And uh, when you have Emmanuel Macron, of all people, uh, coming out as he did today and sort of chiding Biden and saying, I think when it comes to this subject, one is advised to be careful or something like that. <laughs> By know? the way, the second time that yeah, Macron does it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very undisciplined. And I, and I think the reason the White House was walking it back so quickly is because it, it appears to reward Putin in some ways for bad behavior, uh, not because Biden isn't speaking sternly to Putin, but because uh, Putin may take away from this that he's so scared uh, the Americans about the prospect of nuclear war uh, that he has a better hand in the bargaining table. And I think, you know, you can't give in to nuclear blackmail. Vladimir Putin is holding the world hostage. We are all hostages in many ways to Putin. And, and the, the use of uh, this nuclear saber rattling, in my view, is in and of itself uh, a very serious uh, global norm that has been violated by Putin. Because until the Ukraine war this year, no responsible nuclear power has done something like this uh, to use uh, the threat of their nuclear weapons uh, as a, a political bargaining tool. You have had uh, irresponsible country like North Korea does it all the time. But frankly, you know, Putin has now turned himself into North Korea, into Kim Jong-un, because I can't think of you know, there are plenty of nuclear powers that have fought and lost conventional wars uh, in, in the many decades since World War II, right? The United States has fought and lost multiple uh, conventional wars without threatening the losers or the other side with nuclear annihilation. And so I feel that, you know, Putin has already, you know, really crossed a line that will make the world a more dangerous place for as long as all of us live, even if uh, there is no use of nuclear weapons and let's you know pray that there is but you know time and again the top u.s officials stressed out that put, if putin uses tactical nuclear weapons and we're talking about tactical nuclear weapons because obviously you know strategic nuclear weapons are at the end of the planet uh there will be a decisive response decisive response from the side of the united states and its allies but do you have an understanding of what kind of response Washington has in mind. Yeah, that's such a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. No, no, yeah. Now, look, we don't know for sure. We don't know. They're going to game that out of the Pentagon. They're going to game that out in the Situation Room of the White House. They're going to talk about if this, then that. But they don't want to say that out loud because the strategic ambiguity is an important diplomatic tool, right? They want Putin to not know. They want him to be guessing. They want him to be unsure of what would happen as a result. But you're right. I mean, the truth is, is we're not talking about strategic nuclear weapons, but, but you never know once you start down that road where it ends. And that's what Biden is saying here. It may start with one tactical nuclear weapon and then what, NATO comes in and then bombs Russian forces in retaliation because we can't accept this. And then what, Putin uses another one? Does he use it against Poland? Does he use it against... Western Europe is and does one thing lead to the next. If he uses one against a NATO country, do we have to use one against him, et cetera, et cetera. And it's easy to see a spiraling out of control situation where, uh, I mean, one nuclear weapon is too much. And it's easy to see how it spirals far into a far worse scenario. So they don't want to say, and they are hoping that, that if Putin is not a rational actor, that at least people around him might still be, might be rational and understand how catastrophic this would be and how dangerous it would be for Russia as well as for everybody else. But there was somewhere in the United States media, you know, I read that, you know, the response that some of the US officials said that uh, the response was going to be uh, with the conventional weapons. Yeah, there have been reports about that. And actually, Peter and I were on the other day uh, with uh, General Petraeus, who used to be the head of the CIA. And he he sketched out a very aggressive but conventional response that would initially take place. He, he His view was uh, that the United States would immediately enter, officially enter the war uh, on Ukraine side as a result of any uh, Putin use of 
nuclear weapons, that uh, you know there would be attacks on the uh, Russian units or bases from which the uh, tactical weapon was launched uh, inside of Russia, uh, and that you know there would basically be uh, you know the ending of the proxy war and the beginning of the actual war war, and that Putin would not want to bring that upon himself. And that's the part that really, I, I think I keep getting stuck on is that you, you can see how it serves Putin's interests to a certain extent to, to use this nuclear blackmail, right? Because he's, it's changing the subject. We're talking about his nuclear weapons instead of talking about his defeats on the battlefield. Uh, it, it gives him power again over us, which is important. But, and this is a big, but on what planet is actual use of nuclear weapons not the end of Putin's regime, period. You know, already what you hear in Washington, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, is that it's actually not possible for a negotiated peace with Putin. They can, US officials that Peter and I have spoken with are very clear that there is, they cannot envision a scenario where sanctions would ever be lifted on Russia as long as Putin is still in power in the Kremlin. And a Putin use of nuclear weapons, let's just say we avoid you know, full-scale Armageddon. He's, he's changed the calculus. He's made himself an outlaw in the world. And he's determined that everyone in the West, not just the United States, would be not satisfied until he was out of power. So it seems to me that it's very clearly the end of his government and his tenure in the Kremlin, if not his life, to use a nuclear weapon. And I, I, I feel that he's a very calculating man and it's hard for me to see uh, that he would be serious about this because it would be the end of his government. Do you disagree? <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. I think that makes, that makes some sense. I, do, I agree with, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think I, you have to, if you were him, you would have to wonder and worry about that. Well, remember President Obama's red lines with respect to Syria. Yeah. And, you know, when Bashar Assad committed all these atrocities and uh, President Obama kept saying, you know, this is red line, we can cross this. Is, and then there was postponing and postponed and postponed. Yeah. And of course, you know, Joe Biden, the current US president, then was the vice president. So um, to which extent uh, uh, President Biden's understanding of the red lines it's the one that you know President Obama showed to us with respect to Syria. Well, that's an interesting question, an important one, because you're right. The the the, the, the that episode, you know, brought into question credibility, right, of Washington's threats. Now, what Obama would tell you is that he ended up not using force because he negotiated a deal with Russia to disarm Syria of its chemical weapons, and that there was, in fact, over the uh, six, succeeding months. A rather extraordinary, you know, effort to to, to take away these very uh, horrific weapons from Syria. Now, of course, Syria then later reconstituted or had hidden or whatever, so it didn't fully work. But Obama would tell you he got a better result than simply having a couple of airstrikes. It didn't actually do anything. Okay. Well, the problem is that people didn't remember it that way. What they remember is exactly the way you remember it, which is he said he would do it. He didn't do it. Therefore, we shouldn't assume that the Americans will follow through. Biden knows that. I think Biden is being very careful, even though he's very dis undisciplined at times, not to make a very specific uh, threat, but to make it uh, understood that if, if things go too far, in his view, that the America will have no choice but to respond. And I, and I think that he, I think he understands that, he feels that, but he doesn't want us to understand, he doesn't want to be very concrete in what he's talking about, because he, he, he would like to have flexibility to, to decide what to do in a circumstance rather than boxing himself in too, too strongly the way Obama did. Okay, um, if, if I may, you know, the, you know, I understand that it's a little bit, you know, this sort of, you know, the uh, yellow press question, but still some analysts suggest that the US may go after President Putin himself. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, last week we had here over Zoom, uh, Sergei Guryevich, the provost of the CM Spore and the well-known political economist. And I was, to be honest with you, surprised, but Sergei, who's very, very cautious, and you know him, I know him for years, right? And he said that Ben Laden did uh, harm 
to the US much less than Putin already did. And, you know, US went after bin Laden and he was not his, and, you know, in his, he thinks that US may go after Putin himself. Do you envision this? Is it possible? No, no. I, I don't think so. I don't think we're at that place yet. I do think that Putin's record, when you really assess it, is extraordinary, uh, not just in the terrible harm that he's done to uh, millions of Russians, to millions of Ukrainians, uh, uh, Georgians, uh, Chechens, you know, uh, but uh, I, I agree that he has done terrible harm to uh, the international order and to the United States and, and, and its Western allies for his entire tenure. Uh, I, I don't envision that. I would say on this issue of the red line that you know Putin took the wrong lessons. He has a crazy version of Russian history that is informing his war in Ukraine. He also has a crazy version of um, you know, recent history in terms of you know, the United States. However, there is a strong argument to be made that the US has had very flawed foreign policy uh, over the two decades that Putin has been in power and that it has uh, done many things that have caused Putin to take uh, uh, the wrong lessons here. Um, if you look at how Russia was able to survive the sanctions that was placed on it after 2014 and its uh, illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, you could say, well, you know, Putin thought that he could just, you know, have a few more sanctions and get away with it. You could look to 2008 and uh, his invasion of Georgia, and he felt that it was really a very minor, you know, time in the in the penalty box that he faced. Uh, and then all of a sudden, there was Barack Obama come calling to Moscow and you know talking about, oh, we're going to have a reset. And you could look to again and again and again, U.S. officials being wrong uh, about him, and essentially he poisoned somebody using a deadly nerve agent in Great Britain. And even that doesn't make him uh, a pariah. In fact, he does it again. You know? <laughs> uh, and so I do think that the history of you know, red lines being crossed with Putin is, is clearly contributed to this current moment. I, I hope on the nuclear stuff that he uh, is getting the message that you know, we're serious about this and that it's not a line to be crossed. I hope so, because obviously, as you mentioned, you know, in 2008, it was amazing to all of us, you know, after uh, basically Russia annexed 20% of Georgia territory, United States imposed sanctions, and three months after, the United States just forgot about it. It was like, wow, so it's loud, so it's possible. And obviously, you know, uh, United, Russia doesn't, you know, see eye to eye only with the United States, obviously, you know. That's the problem also, of course. Um, Peter, you covered five administrations, as I said, from Bill Clinton through the Joe Biden. You know, in and out of the White House, should the war happen with President Trump in the White House? Will the US policy towards Ukraine and Russia be different? Mm -hmm. That's what some people say when you speak with them, you know, on the off the record basis. If yes, in which ways? Yeah. It's a great question, obviously. President, former President Trump has said, oh, Russia wouldn't have done this, Putin wouldn't have done this if I were in office. Well, we don't know, obviously. And that counterfactual is impossible to prove. It's possible he's right. It's possible Putin wouldn't have felt the need to do it because there's no way that he would have expected Ukraine to join NATO because Putin, Trump was trying to break NATO up. What we report in our book is that Trump came closer to pulling the United States out of NATO than anybody really understood at the time. That we heard him talk about it, but sort of thought it was a false threat, a sort of a braggadocio, or not braggadocio, a bravado, you know, uh, boisterous, uh, what's the word I mean? Blustery stuff. <laughs> I'm not talking about. Well. Uh, but in fact, he kept talking to his aides and wanted to pull out, and they kept trying to stop him along the way. So a second Trump term, you might expect him to pull out of NATO. If we had not been in NATO, the United States had not been in NATO at a time when Russia invaded Ukraine, imagine what a different scenario that would be. If part of Putin's strategy, part of Putin's goal in invading Ukraine was to drive a wedge in the West, he obviously miscalculated because the exact opposite happened. But he wouldn't have needed to do that with Trump in office because Trump was the one who was disrupting 
NATO. In some ways, Trump was doing what Putin would have wanted him to do. So we can't make a judgment on what would have happened necessarily if Trump had been in office. But I do think it's important to remember how much Trump was doing what Putin would have wanted him to do. There's this great moment or extraordinary moment in our book after the Helsinki summit where, of course, Trump is standing next to Putin and says, you know, I basically takes his word on the election interference over that of his own intelligence agencies. And Dan Coates, back in Washington, is the director of national intelligence, appointed by Trump. He's in charge of all 17 national intelligence agencies, access to all the secrets in the American government, a former Republican senator, not a liberal, not a deep state actor. And he's watching the Helsinki summit, where Susan was. I don't know if you were there. Susan was at Helsinki. He watched this and thought to himself, maybe Putin really does have something on Trump, that there was no other way to explain Trump's affection and admiration and deference to Putin other than that perhaps the president of the United States was compromised by Russia, which is an extraordinary thing, I think, that uh, the likes of which we still haven't really quite fathomed. Yeah, just to add to the question of Trump and if you were in office as opposed to mm -hmm. Biden, I think... Uh, Peter's probably right that P Putin might not have felt the need to do so because Putin had in Trump, uh, you know, at a minimum, a, a useful idiot who was accomplishing many of Putin's goals in terms of undermining NATO from within. But let's just say that he did. Uh, you can actually, I think, pretty definitively say that um, Trump would not be supporting $40 billion worth of aid to Ukraine because, in fact, he is publicly opposing $40 billion worth of aid to Ukraine. And he has made it very clear uh, throughout his time in the White House. And we you know, write about this as, as have others. Uh, Trump believed Russian propaganda uh, actually even coming into the White House that Ukraine was not a real country. That's what he called it. Uh, that because many Ukrainians spoke Russian, that meant that they would prefer to be in Russia. In fact, he literally told this to the president of Ukraine himself, Petro Poroshenko, the predecessor of Zelensky, came to see Trump in the spring of 2017. He came to the Oval Office. And we know this from Marie Ivanovich, who was the ambassador who was later forced out. So she came- to Ambassador that, to Kiev. Yes, Ambassador exactly, to Exactly, to, yes. to Kiev. Mm -hmm. She came to that meeting in the Oval Office with Poroshenko and Trump. And he told the president of Ukraine, well, I met some guys in Florida. And they told me that Ukraine was not a real country. And no, seriously, he said this to the president of Ukraine. And, you know, just think about that, right? So it doesn't take like, it's not an elaborate thought exercise to think that Donald Trump was not going to support, you know, a massive, like the biggest expenditure of money and weapons, uh, you know, in, in decades as a proxy war uh, to support Ukraine. Because not only has he spoken out against the U.S. effort right now, but he literally does not consider Ukraine to be a real country and certainly not one that would be worth spending billions and billions uh, of U.S. dollars on. So, you know, to me, it's not theoretical at all uh, that, uh, you know, Ukraine would never have been able to hold out this long because it would not have had the support of uh, the United States or of the United NATO. Look at how much effort, you know, Biden himself was the midwife of Sweden and Finland joining NATO, you know? So I think that was a very big political shift in both countries. And while there might've been an enormous political uh, outcry in Sweden and Finland, if, if, if Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, without a, a president of the United States to help make that happen politically, it's hard to see whether they, they would have joined NATO at all. As far as I understand, there are two major schools of thought. Um, existed in the expert community here in the United States and probably in the policy making community. Uh, the one school of thought suggests that the West invested well too much into Ukraine. And the saying goes, Ukraine is not the West. Why should we pay all the bills? It is especially true because, you know, uh, energy bills in Europe tripled, you know, all across Europe and British islands. And uh, if you speak to uh, German um, experts or policy, policy makers or to French, they will tell you that Europe is facing the rise of the far right. In fact, you know, Italy already, you know, 
uh, elected, you know, a far right government. Thanks God, you know, this uh, woman supports this the, the new prime minister from the very very right uh, side of the Italian politics. She supports NATO. Silvani, who was on Putin's payroll, allegedly, allegedly, um, you know, didn't lose. So uh, there are some good things about us, but also in Sweden. All of a sudden, we see in Sweden, you know, that, you know, the, the far right uh, came into power. So, and therefore, you know, Europeans say that United States is the major benefactor of this war because uh, prices on liquid gas that now United States supply to Europe, you know, went up. And basically, United States substitute Russia for, for the gas. And secondary that, you know, of course, you know, uh, um, uh, our sales are on the rise. <laughs> However, Europe is facing, you know, the rise of the far right and Evgeny, you have to understand that that's, anyway. So, and so, and the second uh, school of thought here says quite the opposite, it says that, you know, it develops where I support this point of view, that, uh, that if Putin wins the war in Ukraine, it will go after the rest of the Eastern Europe. From my perspective, it goes without saying that, you know, Poland, Baltics, you know, Czech Republic, you know, for sure, Moldova, Moldova, they are all, you know, there will be. Anyway, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want really, you know, I, I shouldn't, you know, go that far. Yes. Well, I mean, look, you know, there is a debate in the United States, but not much of one that suggests that we don't uh, have an interest in Ukraine, that that percentage of the American polity is still relatively small. It exists um, at the moment more on the far right, but to some extent on the far left. The Heritage, I'm not so sure. the Heritage Foundation, the Tucker Carlson, part of the Republican Party are saying, why should we be spending money in Ukraine? They're a terrible country anyway, blah, blah, blah. It's probably not it's probably not wise to frame American and Western commitment to Ukraine as a defense of democracy per se, because Ukraine is a flawed state and we can get into a big argument as to how democratic it really is. That's not really the point. I mean, we didn't, the United States didn't go in to defend Kuwait because it was a democracy in 1990, 1991. It went in because the idea that borders should be inviolate, the idea that one larger country should not be able to rewrite the borders through the use of force on a smaller, more, uh, weaker country. So whether Ukraine is uh, a, a fully realized democracy or not is really not the point. The point is once you allow a bully to take territory, he's gonna take more. In America, there's, a, there's an old saying, if you give a mouse a cookie, he's gonna want uh, you know, some milk, right? And, the, 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 and he got it, as Susan said, and you got it, as you said, he got it in Georgia. He took Abkhazia and South Ossetia and nobody stopped him. And he went back and he got, you, uh, Crimea, and he took parts of, you know, Luhansk and Donetsk in, in 2014. And so if he were to, the argument is not hard to understand here. If he were allowed to get away with doing it this time, why would he keep, not keep doing it? Even if he didn't go to a NATO country, uh, you could make an argument that NATO is somehow different because it would bring in the United States in a way that he doesn't want. And for Finland, that's an obvious reason why they would want to join. And that now is you know, made things harder for Russia. But I think that the bigger issue is not whether Ukraine is a democracy, but the bigger issue is whether a big country gets to take up a smaller country through force of arms. And what we forget, by the way, one last thing, is Russia specifically agreed not to do this in 1994. When Ukraine agreed to give up its nuclear weapons after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the, the, the memorandum that the Russian government signed, a binding document, was they would not try to alter the borders of Ukraine or violate its sovereignty through use of force. It made a very specific agreement on this. And if that's out the window, then everything's out the window. On top of that, this Budapest agreement in accordance with which Russia, United States and Great Britain guaranteed yes. the borders of Ukraine. Exactly. Guaranteed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, Putin has shown, obviously, he, he doesn't honor Russia's international commitments. That's very clear. Uh, but your question was really about the American politics of the war. And I, I, I agree with Peter that right now it is a marginal sort of where far right meets far left. I think it does exist on the far left uh, as well as on the far right. Uh, it is not you know, uh, a very large or loud part of the debate in Washington right now, uh, except 
that you have Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson. So, you know, they're very loud. Uh, but I'm, I'm struck by how remarkably little public debate there has been over this. You know, America is very inward looking at the moment. We're in a, you know, sort of a kind of five alarm fire for our own democracy. We're caught up in, you know, the post COVID uh, economic uh, problems and inflation and gasoline prices. And, you know, people just aren't debating this. And even though actually Biden has made a pretty extraordinary set of decisions, right? Like as far as foreign policy goes, it's a really big deal. He, he is, fighting a proxy war in Ukraine, you know, with, well, and, you know, there's a strong argument that, that, you know, to your camps in Washington, what I would say is that even among those who are kind of stay the course and you have to stop Putin, there are philosophical agreements, disagreements. And even among that camp, which is the major camp in Washington, uh, the disagreements are, there are some who believe uh, you know, that this is a, a contained conflict and that, you know, you can keep giving Ukraine weapons and, and then and make them win, you know, and push Putin out. Uh, and then there are others who believe that that is actually not possible, that the United States, whether we call it that or not, is already at war with Russia uh, because we are supplying essentially all of the, the weapons that make this a real fight uh, because Putin has said that he's in a war with us. Uh, and for a variety of other reasons, and that while we need to keep supplying Ukraine, this school of thought goes, uh, that wouldn't be the end of the story anyways, because Putin will never stop as long as he's in power, uh, this conflict with the United States that he has unleashed. And, um, you know, Fiona Hill is, is a believer in this school of thought. She, you know, she basically is of the view that we are already uh, in effect, fighting World War III. Now, she doesn't mean that nuclear, you know, and I think it's been mischaracterized. Uh, I wrote about that uh, in The New Yorker, and I think some people kind of mischaracterize it as if, you know, Fiona was saying, well, that means that we're already, you know, headed down the road of nuclear conflict. That's not what she meant. She meant, uh, you know, essentially a land war uh, in Europe that brings in great powers and that, you know, can't really be stopped. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, she's got a lot to that to that analogy. So it's like, you know, the war between, you know, two careers. Yeah, yeah, that it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that it involves um, great powers and that it essentially, uh, there's no obvious way to stop it. I was personally alarmed. I don't know what you think. I, I, I really want to know what you think, actually. When Biden last night not only talked about Armageddon, but he talked about the offering. And I have to say, for me, when I hear the American officials talking about the off ramp, I, you know, it's like a triggering language for me because in every one of these crises with Putin, you know, in Washington, they're always talking about the off ramp, the off ramp. Vladimir Putin does not take American off ramps, you know, like, and so I was very worried actually when I heard Biden use that language. But you know, in November, you have uh, elections. That's what, you know, I love to bet American elections because at least, you know, you can watch that people, you know, there's some contestation, competition, everything that I read about, you know, what, you know, democracy is all about. But uh, great old party may, if not the entire Congress, uh, do expect a significant change in the US policy towards the war in Ukraine as outcome. Of the elections. At the moment, no. I mean, to Susan's point, it is rather remarkable that we are 30 days or whatever it is out from an election, and this is not a big debate point. You're not out there hearing candidates in these districts saying, I'm for spending more money in Ukraine, I'm for not. Some of them are. There are a few. There are a few who are saying, how come we're spending this much money when we have X, Y, or Z that we should be spending on? But for the most part, it's not the dominant issue. The dominant issues in American elections right now are inflation and crime and American democracy and abortion, things like that. And it's this, even though this is a proxy war, even though this is a, a potentially, you could say, a, equivalent of World War III, uh, or at least a version of it, is not the, much of the conversation, which is interesting. And maybe it should be because, in fact, it's actually a really important topic. But on the other hand, our elections are so um, superficial and 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 toxic right now that maybe this is not the best way to have that conversation because we can't do it without making it 
about vilifying each other and, and it would not be a very reasoned conversation. Um, but to the point of the elections, I think that at the moment, you know, it looks like a toss up in the Senate. It's going to come down to one or two seats, it looks like. Uh, if you said it's going to be 5149, everybody would say, okay, I agree with that, but they might just be which one is 5149, Democrat or Republican? It could be either. It could be that close. The House, the Republicans still have the advantage, but the Democrats have had some momentum, partially because of abortion, partially because of the presence of our book topic, Trump, who doesn't seem to leave the stage, and that has motivated Democrats who showed up two years ago to think about coming out again. But I would still guess if you had to put money, you would still say that Republicans are likely to win. They've got a lot of advantages in the, historically in this kind of an election. And that would put Biden in a real bind for the next two years. Doesn't mean that he won't do well. Sometimes Republicans, are, or sorry, sometimes presidents do well by positioning themselves against an opposition Congress. You know, you can show the public why your values matter more than theirs or what have you. And you have the advantage of the bully pulpit that the Congress doesn't have. Uh, remember that Reagan did very badly and his party did very badly in the first uh, election of 1982 and he came back and won a landslide re-election and say, so did basically Bill Clinton and, and Barack Obama even though they lost houses in their first midterms. So it's not necessarily predictive of where 2024 would go but it would make Biden's life more miserable, <laughs> no question. They, they have subpoena power and they would be asking all kinds of questions and they would be uh, uh, resisting any kind of mutual legislation on almost any topic. And I think you would expect the legislative gridlock to dominate those last two years. Again, on Russia, I don't know where that would lead. I think it depends on how long it lasts. There will be a fatigue factor, or at least a risk of a fatigue factor setting in if this goes on for another year or two years, and especially if more billions are spent on it. The, the, the number of people who say, okay, that's enough, could easily grow. You agree? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I do think that Republicans taking over the house would be bad news for Ukraine and for, you know, the alliance overall uh, and, uh, you know, a big distraction uh, potentially for the Biden team. Um, you know, it's not the top of mind. So Can that- Can they overwrite land lease to Ukraine? I think the question is whether they can keep the flow going. I, they're not going to take back money that they've already appropriated, but there is a question about whether uh, they can keep the arms going. And I think that's why you see this big press by Ukraine right now. A lot of this offensive is related to, it's related to a couple things. The weather, you know, they want to do it before the winter and before both sides settle in for the winter, they want to gain, gain back as much territory as they can. Uh, so, and it's also related to the political calendar, including the political calendar in the United States. So the question here would be how much more aid in the future can be coming to Ukraine? Uh, in your most, in your, you know, most recent book, The Divider, Trump and the White House, you put dates, 2017, 2021. Uh, is it that you expect to write another vol volume that there will be, you know, another four years of Trump? But you, you, of course, you know, when you see these dates, you think that, you know, okay, guys decided, you know, uh, that they're going to write the second like book. We're trolling so, you, right? Yeah. Uh, ironically, it was the publisher that wanted to yeah, put the, like the dates. We shouldn't throw the okay. publisher under the bus, but the publisher wanted to put the dates on the cover. And their thought was they wanted to make clear the book was about all four years of his presidency because nobody else has done that book. They wanted to define the book through that title. It's a four year history. Everybody else done a year or a few months here or this topic or there, that topic. But it does look a little different in light of current day. It looks almost like we're trolling people saying, who knows? There might, in fact, one of our reviewers says, I like their book. I I just hope, I, one of our reviewers says, I like their book. I just hope they never write a sequel. So <laughs> we will see. We'll see. Is, if the question is, is he going to run, we'll know more in about 30 days. But I think there's a good chance he does. And I would put money. If you had to bet money, the better bet is to bet that he'll run. You said there is a good chance that he runs. He runs. Yes. So he will run. Yes. If for no other reason, I think that he thinks that running will be some sort of protection against the investigations that are closing in on him. That He thinks that they might resist uh, or be reluctant to charge an active presidential candidate, or that even if they aren't, if they were willing to go forward and indict somebody like him, that he could use that as a political weapon with his base to say, see, they're coming after me because I am a threat to them and I'm running for president and discredit 
the notion of a prosecution. Biden recently said that he was that he's going to run for the second term. Do you expect him to run? And I will keep my mouth shut because we remember <laughs> this period in our yes. history, right? No, that's right. I mean, look, Biden mm-hmm. obviously is already the oldest president, uh, you know, and if he were to run for a second term, it's not just as Peter often says, how old he would be at the beginning of that term, but how old he would be at the end of that term. That is a huge concern, regardless of any of the other issues around, uh, you know, or partisan issues. So I think the one person who could make Biden run again is Donald Trump, unfortunately. Uh, and one of Biden, you know, he's articulated this to others is, uh, you know, his view that he's, you know, might be the only one who could beat Donald Trump. And there are no obvious errors to Biden. Uh, Kamala Harris has not been seen as a success as vice president. She certainly would not, uh, she would face a contested and divided Democratic Party uh, if Biden stepped aside. And so the risks of losing to Trump, if you believe that Trump uh, is a threat to democracy itself, as Biden has said that he does, uh, then you can see the, the thought process that leads you uh, to this outcome that pretty much nobody in America wants. <laughs> it might be the one bipartisan consensus in America is that uh, you know a Biden-Trump rematch is not a good idea for the country. And yet we could possibly be facing that. What about the California governor? Governor yeah. who just announced. Well, I do think that uh, you know Gavin Newsom has been making some very aggressive uh, moves that suggest that he is positioning himself to run and that in fact he would be a very strong uh, candidate for the nomination. Now, many Republicans are very confident uh, that he would be a terrible uh, nominee because they think that California itself is a very divisive uh, uh, thing and that, you know, there are millions of people who, you know, don't want the California way and therefore, regardless of Gavin Newsom, uh, that he might not be a good nominee for the Democrats. But I think he looks uh, very strong given that the other possible candidates don't really have his kind of stature and charisma and experience. So, um, you know, a financial base. Uh, however, he was married to Kimberly Guilfoyle, which, you know, uh, is <laughs> certain to be a big subject of controversy were he to run. So, you know, it's not good is, is the bottom line there, you know, that it's uh, amazing that in this big diverse country, you can really see a lot of scenarios where we could be facing a rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And there is no some, you know, Barack Obama, you know, uh, who is somewhere and nobody knows yet. No, it's interesting. There, I mean, at this point in the process, yeah, knew about you knew that Obama was uh, there. Yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. And at this point, process, no, mm-hmm. anyway, I, well, he had already given, I don't want to go the, into this. No, he had a, uh, the convention speech where he had impressed right. people so much. And, and at this stage, uh, at the 1992 cycle, you knew that Bill Clinton was out there and he had a particularly, you know, skilled, uh, uh, you know, he's a skilled candidate. So we don't see anybody like that now. There's not a Democrat. The Republicans seem to have a deeper bench right now than the Democrats. De- Democrats have a lot of people who would like to run, and maybe one will emerge and become more impressive than they seem to be right now. That's the theory of the case. In the White House, I walked out the other day and I felt for the first time that there's a good chance that they think that Biden's not running, um, but that a year will be enough to find the Democrat who will have the stature to take its place uh, as a nominee, but who that is right now, you know. I have a whole set of questions, but unfortunately, you know, we're running out of time and I want to uh, leave at least several couple of minutes to, to uh, the audience to ask questions. But, you know, still, if you compare, you know, what's interesting that for me, because, you know, I've been doing, you know, all this institutional politics for, for my entire life. And so you think that, you know, you, you have a strong institutional culture in the White House, you know, organizational culture, you have, you know, civil service, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, when you read your book, you almost have a feeling that bureaucracy has no say that, you know, all this institutional culture doesn't exist because Trump came in and basically he was able to sort of turn it all around and base his administration, maybe I'm wrong, on his daughter, and his son-in-law, it, it's amazing. You keep asking, oh, wait a second, is it really about the United States? Yeah, look, Trump certainly per, on a personal level, uh, you know, is the antithesis of, uh, you know, institutionalized rule of law, 
uh, norms, bureaucracy. Uh, Donald Trump was a one man wrecking ball. That was the term uh, that uh, former Senator Bob Corker, a Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, that was the term that he used. Uh, that Trump was a human wrecking ball. Uh, and I think in particular for kind of the norms and traditions of American government, he basically had a highly personalized, almost like a, not either a dictator or maybe even more like a, a medieval uh, king, you know, uh, kind of view, right? That, that sort of people should come to court and he should, you know, dispense justice himself or, uh, you know, assignments uh, in an ad hoc way. Now, of course, the American government is big and vast and uh, the damage that any one individual can do. So there are many things that just went on. Donald Trump had no clue about them. As long as they didn't come to the White House, uh, he ignored uh, you know, many issues and so they could largely proceed. Or in many cases, what the result of that was also very negative because they might hand it over to uh, a particular interest group or con constituency. So Donald Trump, I don't think he cared at all about the Environmental Protection Agency, but he uh, you know, handed it over to a series of representatives of industry who um, you know, had a very free hand to eliminate regulations and roll them back and the like. So you know, he could still do damage in that way. But um, for the things that Trump himself cared about, uh, he really did in many ways explode the model uh, or suggest that our institutions were much weaker than we thought. In, 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 in the Trump presidency in Washington, it would often be said, uh, well, you know, Trump is bad, but our institutions have survived. And I, I honestly think that that is a, an overly rosy assessment when in fact you realize like with the Justice Department at the end of the presidency, we were just one or two people away from the institution not having withstood Trump's demands that it uh, basically launch a fake investigation of the 2020 election that he would then use to uh, overturn the results. So, um, you know, for me, it's, it's a story about the limits of how we think about our institutions. We have you know, just several minutes left. I'm so sorry, you know, I, you know, but if, if you have questions, please uh, ask. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. I have so many questions that I kind of <laughs> narrowed it down to one. Um, so casting your minds forward, what circumstances could you see leading towards reconciliation and what considerations would need to be made in that process? Reconciliation with, with Russia. With Russia, between Ukraine and Russia. Between the US. All right, well, I mean, I, that's a long ways off. I don't think there's going to be any kind of reconciliation anytime soon. I mean, there's there's no way the United States can. I mean, it, it'll be up to Zelensky and the Ukrainians. They have to decide for themselves what, if anything, they're willing to accept as part of a, res, a resolution of this conflict. And the United States will basically back them up. The, the last thing Biden wants to do is look like he's dictating to Ukraine that you have to give up territory, you have to make some sort of concessions, you have to do this or that. So he won't do that. Um, on the other hand, I think he would like there to be a negotiated solution so that they, that they can begin to move on. But I think it would be years even after that before the United States could get anything back to what we consider to be business as usual. Anybody else? Yes, please. I had a question about uh, recent events in Russia and mobilization. So we were listening to stories about people in Jordan and being sent to fight without having proper devices to do so or like paying for themselves. Do you think what are the what are the expectations of that? Is it going to turn out well? Is it going to help Russia? How the people in the government perceive this change? Is it going to change the current lines? Yeah, I mean that's such a good question. It does look like, uh, in addition to Putin's expectations about uh, Ukraine and how it would fight being wrong that he made some bad miscalculations about the consequences of the partial mobilization inside Russia, uh, which has now destabilized his own regime, his own government, I think is at risk because people chose to vote with their feet. Uh, and I, I, to me, the numbers are amazing. I mean, you know, Genia would, would know better how, what you thought might have happened versus what happened. But certainly in Washington, it seems amazing that you know, the reports are that like 200,000 people have left. Uh, that's incredible. 
That's you five hundred thousand yeah. at least. You think least. more five hundred? You know, yeah. there were num numbers seven hundred thousand, but we say that from five hundred to seven hundred thousand is one. It's that sort. Of it's an amazing thing. Um, look, Russia is a bigger country than Ukraine. Okay, it has more people who could fight. It potentially could hold out longer. Uh, than Ukraine, because remember, we're supplying weapons to Ukraine, but we can't supply Ukrainians to Ukraine to fight. And that's always been a weakness that is not talked about as much here uh, in the West. And so that's something I, I would keep my eyes on. But for now, um, terrible miscalculation. Very quickly, you know, just let me one question from uh, from Zoom, because I feel awful. Is discussing any nuclear threat by Russia like this panel was today not benefiting Russia's bluff, which is propped up to strike fear into the people that spread this story and nothing more? Basically, the idea is that any discussing about uh, Russian, uh, the possibility of the uh, Russian nuclear attack is just beneficial to Putin because people are getting afraid of that and blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think I think there's something to that. I think that uh, that's why a lot of people heard what Biden said last night and thought it was a mistake that he would say that because it was giving in to Putin's nuclear blackmail. Uh, however, I would say that uh, because Americans are so tuned out from foreign policy in general, uh, there is responsibility that the president has to try to communicate exactly what the stakes are at a moment like this. And uh, Putin has been extraordinarily reckless. And he has done things, uh, shattered many uh, norms of you know international behavior. And so you know it's, it's not terrible or crazy for Biden to try to explain to people how risky the situation is, given that Americans are so disconnected. Um, I'm getting the thank you very much. You know, unfortunately, we have to round up it here. Thank you so much. It's amazing, you know, Susan. People, thank you so much. Yeah. Definitely, there are plenty of questions that I would ask, audience would ask. But unfortunately, we have such a limited time. Guys, you know, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank yeah. You. yeah, thank you. And you know, I have to end.